I'm uh, David Scare, and I'm professor of uh, systematic theology and uh, New Testament at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. And uh, this particular episode is part of the seminary series uh, in reviewing the pericopes for uh, the coming Sundays. Uh, and this, we are, the Sunday that we're looking at now is the Transfiguration. Um, and uh, the pericope comes from the book of Hebrews. Now, the uh, transfigure, uh, what we're going to say on, from the Hebrews, chapter 3, 1 to 6, in some way is going to be correlated into uh, the uh, fact of the, of the celebration of the transfiguration. Um, when we preach, uh, the epistles are really not intended to be preached during the Holy Communion service. Um, for Luther, the, the epistles were preached in Matins, and then came the service, the regular service of the Holy Communion, and then the evening, uh, he preached, or the pastor there in St. Mary's preached on the Old Testament. Um, so uh, we cannot avoid the concept of the transfiguration, and somehow that's going to have to be molded into the sermon, if, regardless of whether it's the Matins or the, um, the, the regular Holy Communion service. And now a word about the book of Hebrews. It is very unlikely that our people will be overly conversant in the book of Hebrews. And there are several reasons for that. First of all, it's not considered part of the Pauline canon among Paul's epistles. The second thing is that it's, um, it's an unusual writing in the New Testament. There is no other writing like this. Now some of this uh, data can be included in the introduction to a sermon. I don't see why not, uh, because otherwise they're not going to hear it. Our people do not go to the Bible class necessarily, and there's no reason that we cannot use the sermon to provide biblical data. Now, with the rest of the New Testament, um, the, the Gospels, they fit into a certain pattern. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of course, are synoptic Gospels, and they share some of the same material, but as we have shown in the past, each of those evangelists has his own take on the material. They cannot really be blended in together into a harmony, um, uh, as it, and this, there is a harmony available from Concordia Publishing House, and I don't think oh, that's all that valuable. It, ru it ruins the, the unique contribution of each writing. John's Gospel stands out by itself but there is a correlation in some places to the other three. Acts, of course, is individual, it is an individual book by itself because it doesn't have to do with the life of Jesus, but the life of the apostles, namely Peter and Paul. And then the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature, speaking of what's going to happen at the end time. I think this kind of raw data may not seem to be appropriate for a sermon but uh, it should be brought to the attention of the people uh, because they are, they do have a high regard for the scriptures, the New Testament, they should know what's up. Now what makes the um, epistle to the Hebrews unique, and it is unique, is that it's this. It's like a gospel in that it has Jesus as its center. Now you know, we all know that for the gospels, each of the four Gospels, every page Jesus is front and center. He is the topic of the Gospels. So it's like, a, it's like a Gospel. The epistles are different. They have to do with theological matters that the congregation and the clergy are facing at a particular time. And um, uh, they are instructional. They are specific it's easier to take the, uh, the epistles and to uh, pick out certain parallels in the life of the people. The Gospels, of course, are a challenge because there is a theological undergirding in the narratives of Jesus. It's not just an historical narrative. It's uh, the, the, the most profound theology is embedded in the Gospels. And uh, we cannot, uh, there's no one technique whereby we're going to get uh, to uh, to, get, uh, to get, bring it out. 
that I always like to bring that mention the case of the uh, of Matthew's uh, genealogy. It looks like a raw genealogy, but that's not what it is. It's the history of Israel. It's a it's an abridged form of the history of Israel, and as it goes along, it makes its jabs by point by including Gentiles into the genealogy. Uh, when one way are are forerunners of Jesus to make the point that Jesus is going to be the uh, savior of the Gentiles too, which comes out in the end. Now with Hebrews, you have this. It's all about Jesus. It, it, you, let's say this about Hebrews. It is the most theological, doc, theological, Christological document in the New Testament. It's all about Jesus, but it's not about Jesus according to his earthly life. This is the picture of Je This has to be divine because it is looking at Jesus not from below, but from above. And from that point of view, it resembles the Gospel of John. Um, it starts off with the glorification of Jesus, um, his sitting at the right hand of God. It then addresses particular problems in the congregation. And... Uh, it sees the true reality in heaven. And on that account, some scholars, and perhaps they're right, they see a certain platonic uh, perspective, platonic philosophy perspective in the epistle to the Hebrews, in that the true reality is in heaven. And the reflected reality, what happens on earth, reflects what God um, what uh, reflects what God has already done. Now, this is uh, a little bit unusual for any writing uh, from, uh, because the scriptures are inspired, but they are written from an earthly perspective. That they are written from the perspective of the, how the writer viewed uh, the incidents in the life of Jesus, how he reflected on them, and how he uh, consulted other people to incorporate their reflections in, in what he wrote. So uh, and it, the Gospel of Matthew is the most corporate document of all of them. And Luke, Luke has his own uh, perspective of getting started off. With, you start off in, in the temple in Jerusalem, and by the time you get to the end of Acts, uh, you're in Rome. So the Gospel has been spread in all nations. Mark is the more clever of the writers. They say Mark is the first one because he's simple. The people who've come to that conclusion, at least in my estimation, have not bothered to read Mark, uh, um, to look at his vocabulary, because just looking in the Greek would indicate you have something else. John, of course, sees, he, he has the heavenly perspective, but what Jesus does, he does on earth. What we have in Hebrews is this. It is reflecting, it is, it is reflecting, the true reality is in another world. And um, this, uh, this is certainly not the first step in how, uh, in how a religion should be approached. Uh, you do know already that there are three books that should not be, uh, which should not be used as uh, introductions into Christianity. One is Ephesians because it speaks of God's elect, uh, God electing Christians before the uh, believers before the foundation of the world, which seems very arbitrary until we see the, unless we are already fully informed about the rest of Christianity. That's not the first article of faith, the article of predestination. It does explain God's, God's grace in bringing people to faith. Or the book of Revelation, because it deals with uh, symbols, which are sometimes hard to stay on. And the people love the book of Revelation because they are looking for something uh, phenomenal, something which is unusual, something which will tweak their fancy. That's the book of Revelation. And one should very cautiously approach the book of Revelation and in, uh, not in what's going to happen. The, you know, among evangelicals, uh, they get their doctrine 
of the thousand year reign on earth of the kingdom of God, the premillennials, that the millennium is going to come and then Christ will arrive, or Christ, or the postmillennial Christ will come, and then the, the, the reign of God will begin and will be like an earthly kingdom. All kinds of unusual, we've had uh, all kinds of unusual reactions when the book of Revelation is led to stay, stand on its own. So far as the book of Hebrews is concerned, and that is, it, it has the best possible Greek in the New Testament, classical Greek. And uh, for years, um, in, in advising students on which books of the Bible to study, I have uh, urged them to veer away from uh, the book of James, uh, the book of uh, uh, Hebrews, and the first four verses of, of Luke. Now, you can't obviously uh, read the book of Luke without going to the first four verses, but you do have a more classical type of Greek formula than Luke uh, goes into the more common Greek called the Koine. And uh, so as the, as, the cookie, as the cookie crumbles by chance, my first assignment in the Greek New Testament here at the seminary, and that assignment came half a century ago, was in the book of James. And uh, I really love the book of James. And every time I go through it, I'm, I thought, you know, you don't really know, ever know it. We must get over the idea that the clarity of the scriptures, what they call the perspicuity of the scriptures, means that we are fully going to understand what it is. Uh, you know, find out that uh, because uh, as preachers, uh, we do, whether you're on the one-year series or the three-year series, you, it, it repeats itself. And it's great that it repeats itself. I mean, it repeats itself because every year uh, through the church calendar, we follow, we go through the life of Christ. And this is something which we must do, and in fact, which we look forward to, because that's what faith consists of. Now, the other book, uh, uh, besides James, that has the most, I would use the word difficult, my colleagues who are much more equipped in classical Greek than I am, um, uh, they wouldn't have the same problem that I have, and maybe some of you have, and that is uh, uh, facing the Greek of the uh, book of Hebrews. But on the other hand, there is a reward because in the complexity of the language, there, is, there are great treasures to be found. Now to get to the topic of the, of the book of Hebrews. Traditionally, uh, Paul has been considered its, its author. Um, this, this appellation that Paul wrote, it had to come very early. And now I have distanced myself from that point of view years ago. Simply, it was the thing to do. Now I'm reconsidering it from this point of view. There are some people, the argument that it's not, not like anything which he wrote. I don't know how valuable that argument is because it assumes that in all our situations, whether we're dealing with children, adolescents, congregations, fellow pastors, our own family, that we're all we're going to speak in the same way. Um, there are some people who are so genius, literarily genius, that they can adjust their way of speaking in different situations. So it, um, I'm, it, I'm not going to say that Paul is the writer, but I'm not so sure that we can dismiss it. See, from this point of view, Paul cannot write a gospel because if he wrote a gospel, he would be dependent on the reports of other people. And this would put his own apostleship, as maybe not in jeopardy, but it would indicate that he is a, an apostle of the second rank. He, is not a, he cannot qualify as a witness of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, maybe through apparitions later, but not to the historical moment. Um, whoever this fellow is, you have to be utterly amazed at who this writer is. His, his use of his, his extensive vocabulary, the way he argues. Uh, but he's completely at home in the Old Testament. He, um, he can go through the Old Testament, pick out all kinds of references 
and, uh, and b b uh, blend them together into his writing. At the same time, he is a great classical writer in that he is writing a theology. This is an epistle in the sense that he is addressing specific problems in the congregations, whoever who are receiving, who are receiving this. And uh, uh, there are some magnificent clues in the epistle. Towards the end of the epistle, he says there are some people who are not allowed to eat from their altar which is a reference to the Holy Communion, specifically to Jews. They have their sacrifices. The Christians in the Holy Communion receive their sacrifice, and that is Christ's body and blood. So the writer knows of the practice of Holy Communion. He also, it's, it's also written at a time, uh, it's strange that they, they would be given the letter to the Hebrews, it might be, a, a, it, it certainly seems that a person, um, that the readers of this would have to be very well informed. They'd have to have two qualities. They'd have to be, uh, they'd be, have to be people who would enjoy in some way or another uh, the classical Greek language. The second thing is that they'd have to be informed in the Old Testament to follow the argument of, of the writer. So in, in Hebrews, you're bringing two explicit traditions in, in together, together. And um, it is a gospel, but not of the earthly life of Jesus. It's a theological gospel of how Jesus appears to God. It is God who, it is only God who can give us this perspective on the, on the, work, of, on the work of Jesus. And at this time, uh, it has to be before the year 70. It doesn't seem as if uh, it, he speaks of the temple, he speaks of the temple of Jerusalem, and he speaks of their priest, he speaks of the Jewish priesthood. So it has to be a time before uh, the temple itself is destroyed. So uh, with all these kind of dates that the scholars give, there are good reasons for that, but they also have to be taken they are not actually uh, died in cement that this is the only possibility. So I would put it at least before the year 60. And it has to do with people who have not completely divorced themselves of Judaism. Now, from, uh, this, this, is important, this is significant in how we're going to read this gospel. Uh, a number of years ago, and boy, that's ancient history, there was a student here who uh, was converted from a Mormonism, the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. And uh, the uh, local stake, the leader of the local stake, found out about him and began inviting him over to the house for dinner. I don't know the final end of that student, but... He, 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 left, he did not finish his seminary education and was drawn back into Mormonism. So this is a period, the line between Judaism and Christianity was, not, was still being drawn more distinctly than what it is today. And so there is a, there's always a temptation to go back to the old religion. Uh, we have members, by the way, who are brought up in evangelical churches and Baptist churches, and they still feel more at home in the, those religious communities. This, this is simply a fact of life. Well, this is what this, this, is what this epistle is uh, about. And so on that account, it does reflect the ministry of Jesus. Uh, everybody did not become Christian, or should we even say Lutheran, when uh, to the ministry of Jesus. It takes a, a long while. Uh, so today, this pericope. Now, I, am, I, was, I'm not, I was not privy to how the epistles were chosen uh, but the, uh, uh, for each particular Sunday. I think, it's, uh, I think it's really great. I am a great believer in the three-year series. 
because it does take us into parts of the scriptures which we would not ordinarily go, and this would include Hebrews. I'm not so sure that there's any passage from Hebrews in the one-year series. Maybe it is, but Hebrews is not front and center. Yes, when you look at Hebrews, <coughs> you, you certainly are welcome to conclude that it deserves every honor uh, that it ever receives. And uh, so the central figure here, in the uh, besides Christ himself, the central figure in this in Hebrews 3, uh, 1 to 6, happened to be the person of Moses. Now, uh, if there has ever been a maligned person in the Lutheran tradition, it would be the person uh, from the Old Testament, it would have to be Moses. Uh, that, that's because of the Lutheran understanding of the law and the gospel as actually being so diametrically opposed that um, Moses doesn't come out very well at all, I think, even in some of the things that Luther says. But here he is the one who is to be, he's the first one to be, he's the first figure to be introduced from the Old Testament into uh, in, in the book of Hebrews along with Christ. Now, the reason I would think that this epistle was chosen, uh, Hebrews was chosen, is because in the transfiguration, you have, along with Jesus, you have appearing Moses and Elijah. And according to Luke, they are discussing his exodus. That means his leaving the world. Um, uh, just as the Jewish people went from the captivity of Egypt into the, promised, uh, into the promised land through the Exodus, so here also uh, they discussing the Exodus where Jesus will go from the tyranny of death and sin and the devil into uh, the life with God through his, through his death and then his r resurrection. That's why Moses. Now, uh, Moses, now the writer, I, I, it's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's almost humiliating to, uh, to offer a commentary on the figure of Moses because he is, he's the only one. He's the, well, Abraham spoke to God, but the one who spoke to God and could, over, over a long period of times directly was Moses. We do not know how, in the Old Testament, the phrase is, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and Jeremiah, any of the prophets, Amos. We don't know how that word of the Lord came. Did it come through another person? Come through dreams? How did that happen? But here we have Moses, who is the conversational partner with God himself. And... Uh, we, uh, what, what the writer, what the writer is, is intending to do is to show that Jesus is like Moses. Um, this is not an unusual, this is not an unusual comparison. Um, uh, on this account, it just seems to me that this writer is, in, is, is knowledgeable with uh, one of the written gospels, that one of the, one of the written gospels have already been are extant when he writes, because the idea in uh, the book of Matthew, Jesus himself is Moses. That's the, that that is the great genius of that evangelist. He presents Jesus as Moses. Jesus steps into the role of Moses and becomes the true Moses. He goes to the mountain to teach. And he ends up revealing himself as God. And uh, in Luke, he is like Moses. Um, so this is not an unusual theme. And I, I bring these things out for this reason. Lutherans are not as conversant in the Old Testament as are many of our evangelical friends. Uh, and there's a, there's a reason for that. They have a different view towards the Bible uh, 
they see it on they see it all on on a level, while Lutherans see the uh, the Old Testament pinnacling leading up to the person of Jesus, and in going up to the person of Jesus, you always uh, suffer from the uh, possibility that you will leave the Old Testament behind. Uh, just recently, I came across an amazing reference in Schleimacher. Now, that's, a, that's for many people, at least, that's an unusual sign to name, but for anybody who was trained in, in the theology of the Missouri Synod, they know that Dr. Francis Pieper, our great dogmatician, did not have much use for Schleimacher. Came across this reference about Schleimacher. He said, you're going to be surprised that Many people will be surprised that we derive our confession, our theology from the confessions of the evangelical church. That's what he says. And he means the Lutheran and the Reformed. That's what he means. And if we don't find anything that will support our theology and our confessions, we'll go to the New Testament. Then he finishes it off saying that we will in no way go to the Old Testament. The Old Testament has nothing to offer. That's what he said. That's how we're going to do theology. And um, under the one-year series, there are no Old Testament readings. And uh, so th there is a reason for our, our deficit, our deficit in the knowledge of the Old Testament. Now, here we are coming to the person of Moses. And so in preaching on this particular pericope, it will not be, if, you, it's, if you're capable so far as uh, the capability of time, not your own personal capability, is that uh, you, you'll have to bring, <clears throat> it would be helpful for the people uh, to bring in certain episodes from the life of Moses, how he was the chosen leader of God. He's, he's, <laughs> we, he's a Christological figure in the Old Testament. He was persecuted at his birth, he, is, uh, he has to flee Pharaoh, and uh, he becomes, he, 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 at the end, he becomes the leader of God's people. There is a progression there from uh, exaltation to humiliation to exaltation. And um, so we'll take a look at the pericope as we go through. So he says, when my beloved brother, my beloved brothers, uh, who are partakers in the heavenly calling. Now that's, that, that is already he sets the tone. The heavenly calling. Uh, the call that comes from another realm. Now is he, is he speaking to pastors here? Or is he speaking to everybody? I suppose you could go either way with that one. The heavenly calling, the call that comes from above. It's, oh, I wonder if he has in mind the uh, transfiguration in which God calls Jesus his son from heaven. And then he says, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Oh, that's utterly magnificent. Because the Greek word there, katanoio, doesn't mean just think. Kata always intensifies it. Concentrate on the apostle and the high priest, the messenger of, 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 our, of our confession, who is Jesus Christ. A most amazing statement because it is saying that Jesus here, when it says origin of our confession, this means what we say in dogmatics, the, uh, the fides quae, the totality of what we believe, the faith. He is the messenger. Now, if you, have, if you have to handle the Islamic question in your sermon, and you might want to do that, and that is, for Islam, Muhammad is the prophet. Here Jesus is given a similar status. He is the messenger. That's what the apostle, he is the one who has been authoritatively sent by God. And then he's called the high priest. Ah, yes. This is, as we, as, since Lent is only a few days away, um, the high priest, 
Now, you're going to, sh you're going to shake a few cages. The, uh, the, uh, the writer shakes a few cages with that word because here the writer is putting up a rival high priest to the high priest who was now, at the time of writing, is doing his work in the temple. It will come out later, by the way, because the high priest... Uh, uh, according to Jewish regulations, goes into the Holy of Holies once a year. Jesus goes in to the Holy of Holies only once a year, and he doesn't come in with a sacrifice. He is himself the sacrifice. Now, that's a thought that, couldn't be that can be introduced because that's what Lent is all about. And then he's compared uh, that he, he was just as faithful he is just as faithful as Moses. Now, in, in this type of uh, grammatical construction, it is Moses who is the faithful one. Now, Jesus is... Comp now, the people know, the people know Moses. That's why is this, writer, this writing seems to be written to Jews, some of whom maybe still be practicing Jews. He says... G you think very highly of, of Moses, think also Jesus of being very highly. Now, because of the Lutheran dualism or dichotomy between the law and the gospel, uh, Moses is portrayed as the one who gave the law, God's accusation against us for, for sin. This is not exactly what the Hebrew, the, 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 uh, where the book of Hebrews is saying. He's speaking about Moses who was persistent in carrying out his duties. Now, Moses gets a bad rap because he commits two infractions and he's not allowed to go into the Holy Land. And he carried out his ministry for 40 years with very rebellious people. And the story comes up too often that there are congregations who are not willing to follow the lead of the pastor as he tries to carry out what his calling is. Now, that's not an unusual thing because it goes back to the Old Testament where the people resisted the prophets. And here's Moses. He was faithful. He was faithful in, in God's, God's house. Um, and then in verse 3, the writer uses Moses to let Jesus climb over Moses, and that is that Jesus is is more worthy is is more worthy than Moses. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of the house has greater has greater honor than the house. Now, that's kind of a that's kind of a general principle. At least I've been involved in uh, constructing a house. Uh, I was a contractor, which is an absolutely foolish thing. We had some students who, were, who knew how to read blueprints, do the work. But the person who puts out the blueprint is the true genius. The contractor, the architect, is the true genius. The house is only the reflection. Now, does this have a double meaning? Are we presenting here, is Jesus being presented here as the creator? And that the creator has more value than the creation? I think that's a principle that was worth preaching about. Because <laughs> with the environmental movement, uh, it seems as if the, the world has its own life and that we can change it. It has absolutely, it does not even bring God into the picture at all. That if, if, with a, if there is a God and he created the world, well, that God, at least from a logical or philosophical point of view, could do it again. The house cannot, the house cannot duplicate itself. The house is the result. Or does the house here mean the, uh, the church, the community of the believers? 
that's the way it's going. This, this is the way the writer is going to develop his thought. The builder of the house has greater honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Now here he is arguing. Yeah, if you look, the Greek allows this interpretation. Indeed, this way. Each and every house is organized by someone. It's not just built, but somebody had a plan of how it should be. And uh, at least on PBS, I watched the pro I have seen this program of Franklin uh, uh, Lloyd Wright. How he there are ex architectural geniuses, and his houses. Or some of them are still standing. And you can admire his genius by looking at the house. The house just did not happen to be. You have a whole bit. Uh, Masons speak about God as the great architect. No, he, God is more than the great architect. He is the one who calls everything out of nothing, which is also a teaching of the book of Hebrews. But the, the architect, that is an art. That, that, is, uh, that is an act of internal genius. It's intuition of how things should be arranged. And uh, this is what God is and what he's speaking about here of the church. Now comes the accolade. Uh, and then it goes on in verse 4. It says, but the one who, and this is, a, this is one of the few passages in where, where God is speaking of his creator, God is the one who laid down the plans for everybody. That's why it should be read. God was the one who laid down the plans for everyone. And uh, when the house was built, Moses was completely in charge. Now, on this particular point, you might want to make a reference to the Old Testament that is not simply a collection of books by the prophets, but there is one basic book, and the Jews still understand it today, for the Old Testament, and that is the Torah, the first five books. And it's called the five books of Moses. That is the foundational book. Every other prophet, every other book gets its validity from Moses and the books which he wrote. So uh, Moses is not listed among the prophets. He is superior to the prophets, and the Old Testament prophets give a commentary and an application of what Moses wrote until the people of their day. That might not be a bad idea. Really, in the, in the, in those, in the five books of Moses, the book of Genesis is primar has the primacy. That has the primacy. There the plan of salvation is laid out for all time. And then the next four books dealing with uh, the birth of Moses up to his death in Deuteronomy speaks of how what God uh, revealed in the book of Genesis plays itself out in the life of the Jewish people. And um, Moses, he's not called a prophet. He's called, uh, he's not even called a servant. In verse 5, he is called a therapon. Now, most, uh, the, the Greek word for servant is adulus. But that title is not good enough for Moses. He is a therapon. He is the supervisor. Um, and he, he spoke about things which, are going, which were going to happen. Here is this, the Christological motif in Moses, his purpose, and also the Christological motif theme in the rest of the Old Testament. But he, did, he was the one who first said it in an authoritative way. He spoke of the things which were going to be. Now Christ comes along and he takes the place of Moses. And he has this kind of advantage. He is actually the son of the builder. He is the son of God. Uh, this is always, it's always an issue, you know, when you, uh, when you have a babysitter, 
Are you a banani? You know, that, those, those people take the place of the mother. The mother's not there. But when the mother comes home, she is the one who takes charge. Christ replaces Moses. Well, it might be better to say that Christ absorbs Moses into himself. Um, uh, and then this concludes that we are of the house of we are we are the house that God built and the house that Moses supervised and which Jesus brought to perfection. And so this, what this means is that the church is the continuation of the Old Testament people of God. Now, depending upon the amount of time you have for your sermon, if you preach two sermons, one on the epistle, that's Hebrews, and one on the gospel, the transfiguration from Luke, then you can concentrate on the person of Moses um, in your sermon. There is certainly more than enough material, and I think the people would appreciate uh, a sermon on Moses because they, they are not as well informed, at least our people are not as well informed as other people are. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a very successful and blessed Sunday with your preaching.